Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Institute for Church Life's uh, Mathis Lecture Series. Uh, Father Michael Mathis, CSC, was a priest of the Congregation of Holy Cross who started the study of liturgy at Notre Dame. And this lecture series promotes undergraduate and graduate study of liturgy and spirituality at the University of Notre Dame. I'm Jim O'Malley, the director of the Center for Liturgy, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Greg Hillis for tonight's lecture, The Mystical Fire of Christ's Charity, Thomas Merton on the Mass. Dr. Hillis is Associate Professor of Theology at Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky. His interest in historical theology and the patristic period, which is his primary interest, does not sufficiently describe his levels of expertise. He's well versed in 20th century theology and in spirituality. And for those of you who followed him via Twitter, the perils of instant replay in Major League Baseball, which is his sort of official, uh, uh, in addition to baseball, his unofficial pastime is, is griping over instant replay, <laughs> which is a worthy gripe, indeed. Uh, Dr. Hillis is a resource monk theologian. He engages in the highest level of historical work, but he does so aware of the great theological and spiritual questions of the human being in late modern life. Indeed, his blog, My Unquiet Heart, is an immersion into the world of Thomas Merton, if you've paid attention, who lives so close to Bellarmine, whose monastic community is frequently visited, visited by Dr. Hillis, and whose university hosts his library. Few are better able to address our topic tonight on Merton on the Mass. A note about how I got to know uh, Dr. Hillis. Academics prefer narratives that show the seriousness of our encounters. Some <clears throat> illustrious conference in Rome. But I met Dr. Hillis on Twitter. <laughs> in fact, I didn't meet him until I gave a lecture at Bellarmine, facilitated through Dr. Hillis. And now he's been to an ND football game, uh, stayed the night at our home, and is someone that I would call a real life friend, and someone who I look forward to hearing speak to us tonight uh, on Thomas Merton's liturgical Eucharistic vision. So let's welcome Dr. Hillis. Thanks. I could probably spend the next hour talking about instant replay, if you like. <laughs> this, by the way, I wanted you to have this picture. Uh, being at the archives at Bellarmine, we have a lot of pictures. I have some audio, too, that I may uh, play, depending on how the evening goes. But this is a picture of Thomas Merton um, serving the Mass, saying the Mass, uh, to, for a kneeling Jacques Maritain who had come to visit Merton uh, at the Abbey of Gethsemane. The two of them are very good friends. And the letters that they wrote to one another, only a fraction of them have actually been translated, or uh, have actually been published. And they're very interesting to read. Last September, in his speech to a joint session of the U.S. Congress, Pope Francis singled out Thomas Merton as one of four great Americans who offer us a way of seeing and interpreting reality. I was thrilled to hear the Pope give a shout out to a man who has inspired me for years and particularly interested in what Pope Francis had to say about him. Merton was, he says, above all a man of prayer, a thinker who challenged the certitudes of his time and opened new horizons for souls and for the church. He was also a man of dialogue, a promoter of peace between peoples and religions. It's significant that the Holy Father drew particular attention to Merton's capacity for dialogue, given the emphasis Pope Francis himself has placed on dialogue throughout his pontificate so far. Dialogue was indeed a prominent theme during his trip to the United States and was the focus of his address to the U.S. bishops at the cathedral in Washington, telling the bishops that I cannot, I cannot ever tire of encouraging you to dialogue fearlessly. The Pope exhorted the bishops, and frankly all of us, to be unafraid to articulate our viewpoints boldly and clearly, but to do so from a position of genuine encounter, 
by which we approach others in love. Such encounter means that we affirm others first and foremost as persons, and in Pope Francis's words, to realize deep down that the brother or sister we wish to reach and redeem with the power and closeness of love counts more than their positions, di distant as they may be from what we hold as true and certain. Pope Francis's understanding of dialogue finds significant echoes in Merton's writings, an example, and was no doubt the reason why the Pope chose to highlight this facet of Merton's thought. However, there are some who view with suspicion the Pope's emphasis on dialogue, viewing it as a meaningless buzzword that simply masks relativism and a hidden agenda to conquer and silence opponents. Likewise, a quick internet search reveals quite a few websites calling into question whether Merton really was a Roman Catholic or not, and point to his willingness to engage in dialogue with Eastern religions as proof of his waywardness. The American bishops did little to allay suspicion of Merton when in 2005 they decided to delete him from the opening chapter of the American Catholic Catechism, which was to contain profiles of significant American Catholics. When asked why Merton was deleted, then Bishop Donald Wuerl replied, quote, that we don't know all the details of the searching at the end of his life, end quote. In other words, we don't know if he was a real Roman Catholic or not. A brief side note, Cardinal Wuerl was among those seated in the House of Representatives during the Pope's address to Congress. <laughs> it may seem odd to begin a lecture on Merton and the Eucharist by focusing on the notion of dialogue, but I have a point. The same Catholics suspicious of Pope Francis' exhor exhortation to dialogue are generally the same Catholics suspicious of Thomas Merton. So the Pope's nod to Merton did little to appease those who view Merton as a syncretist whose call to dialogue threatened Catholic tradition and led him away from the church. I want, therefore, to recover Merton as a Roman Catholic, and it seems, deeply, or it seems particularly appropriate to do so by focusing on his Eucharistic theology, a theology that is deeply Catholic. Many seem to forget that Merton was more than a monk, writer, poet and contemplative. He was also a priest whose theology and self-understanding was shaped by his daily celebration of the Mass, and a priest who both loved the liturgy and understood deeply the implications of the Mass he celebrated. While there is little in Merton's Eucharistic theology that is entirely original to him, he articulates this Eucharistic theology in a manner that is beautiful, profound, and compelling. Moreover, and this is why I began as I did with reference to Merton and Pope Francis on dialogue, I'm going to argue in what follows that Merton's understanding of dialogue, far from compromising him as a Roman Catholic, is actually rooted in his Eucharistic theology and is in fact the natural concomitant of his understanding of the Eucharist. I'm going to organize my talk as follows. In the first part, I'm going to spend some time looking at Merton's early experiences of the Mass as well, uh, both uh, before he was a convert and also after he be became a priest. The second part of my lecture is more substantial, for here I'm going to look specifically at Merton's Eucharistic theology, focusing on how his understanding of the Eucharist fits into his broader understanding of the human condition and how the Eucharist transforms individuals and communities. Here I'll demonstrate how Merton's emphasis on dialogue is rooted in his understanding of the transformative power of the Eucharist. In August 1938, Thomas Merton walked into Corpus Christi Roman Catholic Church on West 121st Street in New York and attended Mass for the first time in his life. The experience transformed him. He writes in the Seven Story Mountain, the place was full, absolutely full, it was full not only of old ladies and broken down gentlemen with one foot in the grave, but of women and men and children, young and old, especially young, people of all classes and all ranks on a solid foundation of working men and women and their families. Although he didn't stay for the end of the Mass, he writes that he quickly left when he became, uh, because he became scared when the little bells began to ring. Merton was transformed both by the homily, 
how often does that happen these days? <laughs> and by the experience of seeing a diverse group of disparate people united in prayer. This profound experience of unity moved him deeply. He left Corpus Christi and walked down Broadway with a peace he couldn't explain. All I knew, he writes, is that I walked in a new world. His reading became more Catholic after the Mass, and less than a month after this Sunday, Merton approached Father Ford at Corpus Christi requesting instruction to become a Roman Catholic. There were a number of factors that went into this conversion to Catholicism, but this initial experience of unity in worship, this Eucharistic unity, was key. Uh, that's the inside of Corpus Christi, by the way. Almost two years later, at a church in Cuba, Merton had another formative experience of the Eucharist. Thinking he was about to enter the Franciscan novitiate, Merton traveled to Cuba in the spring of 1940, where he immersed himself in the sacramental life of a majority Catholic country. Merton describes Cuba as a kind of sacramental paradise, where everywhere he turned, quote, there was someone ready to feed me with the infinite strength of the Christ who loved me and who was beginning to show me with an immense and subtle and generous lavishness how much he loved me. It was near the end of his trip in the Church of St. Francis in Havana that Merton would have an experience, maybe we can call it a mystical experience, of divine love. The Mass had already begun when he arrived, and seated in the first few rows of the, ch of the church were children, perhaps there for First Communion. The time came for the consecration. The host was raised, followed by the chalice, and as soon as the priest placed the chalice back on the altar, a friar stood in front of the children who in unison began reciting the creed. At that moment, something hit Merton, he says, like a thunderclap. Merton writes that he was brought into direct and immediate contact with the one who had become present in the words of the consecration. He came to, quote, an awareness, an understanding, a realization of what had just taken place on the altar, but it was a realization that was so profound and so intimate that it seemed like the neutralization of every lesser experience." End quote. He finds it pretty difficult to explain what he experienced. There was something pretty transcendent about it, but he makes it clear that love was at the heart of this experience. That picture was supposed to disappear. There we go. This contact was not something speculative and abstract. It was concrete and experiential and belonged to the order of knowledge, yes, but more still to the order of love. Merton writes that he was overwhelmed by a certainty he had not hitherto possessed, the certainty that he was profoundly loved, that God loved him so thoroughly as to become fully his in the Eucharist. When we look at Merton's early experiences as a priest, we see that love lay at the center of his Eucharistic understanding. Merton was ordained to the priesthood seven years after entering the Abbey of Gethsemane and a year or so after the publication of The Seven Story Mountain. In the days following his ordination, Merton describes in his journal what it meant for him to celebrate the Eucharist as a priest, calling his first three Masses, my three greatest graces. Merton writes that the Mass is the most wonderful thing that has ever entered into my life. Why? Because he recognizes that he is participating in that which manifests God's love. Quote, the greatest personal gift that can come to anyone is to share in the infinite act by which God's love is poured upon all. This participation in the sharing of God's love upon all became for Merton a tremendous joy and focus particularly on the moment in the liturgy when the priest commemorates the living. In a letter written to Jacques Maritain two months, after, two months after his ordination, we see how central this part of the liturgy became for him. He tells Maritain, quote, that the names of so many, many dear souls come to me, and that he feels great joy at praying for them, knowing that these people, quote, depend in large measure on that Mass. Merton never lost this sense of responsibility to share his Mass with others, to remember them, and to participate with God in demonstrating love to them. From the time of his ordination until the end of his life, 
Merton's letters are filled with assurances to his correspondents that he will remember them at his masses. This he promised to fellow Catholics, but he was not reticent to tell non-Catholic Christians as well as non-Christians that he would pray for them during the Eucharist. One of the most moving examples is found in his correspondence with Abdul Aziz, a Muslim living in Pakistan with whom Merton carried on a lively interfaith dialogue through letters. In 1961, Merton wrote to Aziz and mentioned to him that he remembers Aziz in his masses. Realizing that he may not understand why Merton would do this, Merton explains that the Mass is, quote, the moment of the nearest presence of God in our lives, and he therefore wants to share this bounty with him. Merton clearly understood the love of God manifested in the Eucharist to be a love bestowed upon all and understood his role as a priest to, be, to, make, to make known this love. As can be seen, Merton's early encounters with the Mass, both as a new convert to Catholicism and later as a newly ordained priest, focus on the Eucharist primarily in terms of love. This is a love that transforms us individually through our union with Christ, but also a love that unites us to one another. It was this unifying power of love that Merton, at his first experience of the Mass at Corpus Christi, recognized in the people he saw praying. It was this unifying power of love that Merton experienced when the children at St. Francis in Havana proclaimed their belief in God with, quote, unanimity and such meaning and such fervor. And Merton was struck by this divine love like a thunderclap. And it was this unifying power of love that compelled Merton to unite himself to his many correspondents in his celebration of the Mass. Merton develops the connection between the Eucharist and love that was so prominent in his early experiences of the Mass in his writings published in the mid-1950s and early 1960s. And I turn now to examine this Eucharistic theology. To explore it, it's necessary first to look at his portrayal of humanity's creation and fall which he addresses at length in a little book published in 1961 called The New Man. Here Merton delves into the Genesis creation story, reading them poetically for what they tell us about the purpose of human creation. Merton draws particular attention to Genesis 2-7 and its reference to God breathing the breath of life into the first human. Merton suggests that the breath of life is a reference to the Holy Spirit and that this verse points to the idea that humanity, quote, was meant from the very first to live and breathe in union with God. What this means is that humans, humans were created to be contemplatives, who have the ability through the indwelling spirit to see things as God saw them, to love them as God loved them. Such contemplation was to be at the heart of humankind's relationship to God, to one another and to the created order. These relationships, quote, were transfigured by divine insights and by an awareness of the inmost reality and value of everything, end quote. In other words, humans were created to see things as they really are, in light of God's loving union with them. Merton spells out the implications of this in his interpretation of the creation of Eve out of Adam's rib which he suggests tells us something pivotal, pivotal about the nature and purpose of human creation. He writes, Adam, perfectly whole and isolated in himself as a person, needs nevertheless to find himself perfected without division and diminution by the gift of himself to another. He needs to give himself in order to gain himself. The law of self-renunciation is not merely a consequence of sin, for charity is the fundamental role of the whole moral universe." End quote. To be created in the image and likeness of God is not to be created as isolated monads. Rather, Merton argues that relationality is at the very heart of human createdness. We were created for one another, to give ourselves to one another. For we were created to love, to see and love as God sees and loves, to be moved in all things ecstatically by the Holy Spirit, to give of ourselves in love just as God gives of God's self to us in the breath of life. 
Merton therefore insists that even before the introduction of sin, humans could not be fully themselves as humans without going out of themselves toward others. To be self-focused would be to be less than human, less than what we are created to be. And this is, for Merton, the problem of sin. The story of the fall is a story of humanity's descent into prideful self-centeredness. By an act of pure pride, Merton writes, Adam put an abyss between himself and God and other men. He became a little universe enclosed within himself." End quote. He withdrew from God into himself and so became less than what he was created to be. As Merton writes, he fell beneath himself into the multiplicity and confusion of external things. As such, he reoriented himself away from the common good and toward his own private good, which had to be first restricted to itself, entrenched within itself, and then defended against every other rival. What emerged was what Merton referred to as a false self, a self that, contrary to the purposes for which humanity was created, attempts to exist entirely self-sufficient and private. Merton often uses the language of false and true self in his writings when talking about spiritual transformation. And he devotes significant attention to these selves in New Seeds of Contemplation, which if you know Merton, uh, many people have read New Seeds of Contemplation. It's one of his best. Merton posits there that each one of us, quote, is shadowed by an illusory person, a false self. My false and private self, he writes, is the one who wants to exist outside the reach of God's will and God's love. This is a self that's self-focused, self-obsessed, and oriented entirely toward maintaining the illusion of its separateness from God. As such, it's a self that exists, as Merton writes, only in my egocentric desires. But it's a self that has no actual reality based as it is on premises that are opposed to human createdness. A humanity focused on self-gratification cannot but be confronted with what Merton calls its own non-entity, its lack of reality. This focus on the self, this living into the non-reality of the false self, not only alienates us from God, but also from one, an one another. Thus resulting in the deep fragmentation of a humanity created to exist in unity. All attempts to find my identity in this false self leads inevitably to conflict with others. As I seek to find myself by asserting myself, my desires and ambitions and appetites against others, and appropriating for myself a private share of the common good. I thus find my identity by accentuating the differences between myself and others. As Merton writes, people whose, li people whose lives are centered on themselves can only conceive one way of becoming real, cutting themselves off from other people and building a barrier of contrast and distinction between themselves and others." End quote. The satisfaction of our material needs and desires over and against the other cannot bring happiness or peace. For the pursuit of such things against the other is based on a lie that is opposed to the purposes of human createdness. However, instead of this compelling us to live differently, we become burdened by what Merton calls an agony of ambivalence, and we project onto our neighbors our dissatisfaction and our self-hatred. We hate them primarily because we see in them what we see in ourselves selfishness and impotence, agony, terror, and despair. We fear and hate the other because we recognize in the other the same destructive and ultimately dissatisfying pursuit of identity and non-reality that we see in ourselves. But as Merton argues in his famous essay, The Root of War is Fear, it is far more satisfying to hate these things in another than to hate these things in ourselves. Fear distrust and, and hatred thus dominate our fragmented societies. Yet humanity, even in its fra fragmentation, 
recognizes the futility of this existence and longs for something more. Merton writes in his 1956 book on the Eucharist, The Living Bread, that, quote, We know in the intimate depths of our being that our life must recover some unity, stability, and meaning. We sense instinctively that these things, this, that these can only come to us from union with God and with one another, end quote. And according to Merton, quote, The Eucharist is the great means which God has devised for gathering together and unifying humankind, end quote. The purpose of the Eucharist is to transform human beings to become what they were created to be, people who exist in unity with God and with one another. The manner in which the Eucharist transforms us is multifaceted. According to Merton, it, the Eucharist reveals to us the very nature of God as love, and so reveals to us that we are profoundly loved. It draws us into the love that is God through union with God, thereby transforming us to discover our true selves in God. It, <clears throat> and in so doing, it transforms us individually and communally to imitate and manifest in concrete ways the love that is God. I'm going to address each one of these points. Merton, as did Augustine and others, ties 1 John 4, 8's statement that God is love to our conception of God as Trinity. To understand that God is love in light of the mystery of the Trinity is to recognize that God exists as three persons who infinitely give of themselves to one another in an eternal embrace of total self-givenness. God is love because God exists eternally loving. We know that God is love through the incarnation of the Son. For through His life and sacrifice, the Son revealed to us the utterly self-giving love that is at the heart of who God is eternally. The intra-Trinitarian love that, God, that characterizes God's self-existence bursts forth and is made known in the Incarnation. Christ's sacrifice on the cross is the fullest expression of this self-giving divine love. For in this sacrifice the Son revealed His total love for the Father and for all humankind. The selflessness that is at the heart of God is made manifest in the self selfless sacrifice of the Son of God. Thus, Merton writes, in the death of Jesus on the cross, we see the one love which is God, and we see the three divine persons loving one another. The profundity of the Mass is that it makes present this sacrifice to us, manifesting, quote, in mystery, the agape, which is the secret and ineffable essence of God himself. What we behold at mass, mass, Merton writes, is the very reality of God's own love. In the Eucharist, God reveals to us over and over again that God is love, that God's nature is self-giving love. For in the Eucharist, God gives of Himself fully to us. And to recognize in the Eucharist that God is love is simultaneously to be confronted with the reality that we ourselves are divinely loved. The Eucharist is, as Merton calls it, the ineffably perfect embodiment of Christ's love for each of us. And in the Mass, Christ comes to us individually, and this is Merton again, with a most ardent and personal love for each one of us. This love is not simply the love that God has for all without exception, but a specific love that reveals Christ to love us as individuals with a love that, quote, reaches out to each one in the inscrutable hiddenness of his own unique individuality. This love transforms us, and it does so both by compelling and empowering us to love in return. Merton is clear that we never lose our natural instincts to love, but because we are, quote, penetrated through and through by the mystical fire of Christ's charity in the Eucharist. Our natural instincts to love are awakened by Christ's love. By uniting himself to us fully, Christ, quote, penetrates our whole being, 
transforming and divinizing us by his power. End quote. Our natural instincts to love are therefore not only awakened, but are elevated and divinized. Merton emphasizes that the Eucharist brings about an actual and intimate union with the Word made flesh, as if He were the soul of our soul and the being of our being. The divine life of Christ Himself is thus poured into us, and this divine life is nothing less than the intratrinitarian love that God is. Our love becomes intermingled with the divine love, and so transfigured. And then this is a, uh, Merton describes it as follows. The charity that is communicated to us in the Eucharist by the heart of the divine Savior is at once the formal and efficient cause of the love which it arouses in our hearts. And our response of charity is like a flame communicated to us by the divine victim, burning in the fire of the Holy Spirit. United to him, we are consumed in the glory of of one and the same flame. God, Merton can be a good writer sometimes. <laughs> Plunged into the very life of God who is love, we enter into the reality of that love. We thus love God in return, and we do so by loving with the love that, God, that Christ bestows on us in the Eucharist, the love that God is in God's essence. For in the Eucharist we are transformed into Christ, becoming what we consume. And in loving the Father with the same love that Christ has for the Father, we come to know the Father intimately. Merton connects the transforming power of the Eucharist to the language of the true and false self that we encountered before. In being transformed to become like Christ, to whom we are united in the Eucharist, we discover our true selves. While the fall is a descent into fragmentary false selves, that exist in opposition to God and to others, quote, the problem of sanctity and salvation is in fact the problem of finding out who I am and of discovering my true self, end quote. To discover our true selves is to discover our identities once again in union with God, the God who loves us and transforms us to love in return. The union is so complete that we discover that, quote, Christ is our own deepest and most intimate self, our highest self, our new self as sons of God. For through his intimate presence in us, the false self is burned away by the fervor of charity. We discover our true selves by loving God, by returning to the intimacy with our Creator, which we were intended to have from the beginning. In short, we discover our true selves by being transformed into Christ's image through union with God. This transformation doesn't occur magically, however. The sacrament may be objective in its operation, but its grace is not communicated to those not properly disposed. To be drawn into and transformed by the divine love of God embodied in the Eucharist requires our active participation. He writes, in order for the sacraments and the Mass to achieve their full effects in the hearts of the faithful, each one must make personal and interior efforts to dispose his own heart and bring it into union with the heart of Christ. End quote. We must strive as far as possible to yield ourselves to the divine action in the Eucharist, to unite ourselves to God's will made manifest in the Eucharist. And this will, God's will, is not simply that we love God, but that we live out the love we experience in the Eucharist by loving others. Merton insists that there is more at stake in the Eucharist than the transformation of the individual. As the sacrament of love that awakens and empowers us to love, the Eucharist is also the sacrament of unity that reforges a humanity that has splintered into pieces. There is, therefore, a deep connection between the Eucharist and the Church, the mystical body of Christ. Merton warns against, quote, the narrow limitations of an individualistic piety, which treats communion as a refuge from the troubles and sorrows of communal living, and ends by cutting us off spiritually from the mystical Christ, end quote. To understand the Eucharist merely as a means of personal consolation, 
apart from loving engagement with our fellow communicants, is drastically to misunderstand the very purposes for which Christ instituted the sacrament, as well as to misunderstand the nature of the church itself. The church is not only a social organization that provides access to necessary sacraments. It is, principally, a living, mystical body, Merton in insists. And through the Eucharist, we are absorbed into that body. Through the sacrament, we become united to our sisters and brothers. In Christ, through a bond of love. Merton describes this beautifully as members of the mystical body being welded together in the flame of an infinite charity. The conversion to the self-giving love of God that takes place through our individual union with Christ in the Eucharist manifests itself in a self-giving love for our sisters and brothers. We thus go out of ourselves toward others, and in so doing we recover the rea relationality that is part of human createdness. But more than this, in giving ourselves to one another in love, we as a church manifest the relationality that is at the heart of who God is as Trinity. Quote, For by selfless charity we reproduce on earth and in time the circumcession of the three divine persons, each in the others, which is the glory and the joy of the blessed in eternity because it is the joy of God himself. End quote. We love with God's love offering ourselves to one another with the same love by which each person of the Trinity gives of themselves to one another in its eternal embrace of self-givenness. Merton is emphatic that the love engendered by the Eucharist is more than gentleness, kindness, and affability. It's more than just kind of looking at one another with doe eyes. Rather, it's a love that is concrete in expression, a love that involves each of us individually going out of ourselves to the other so that we discover our true selves not only in loving God, but in living for others in Christ. United in the love that is God, the mystical body of Christ offers to the world an icon, not only of the intra-Trinitarian unity of love that characterizes God, but also of a recreated community of love that demonstrates to a fragmented world another way of existing, one that is more fully human. But even more than that, Merton argues that the Eucharistic life by its very nature, quote, is oriented towards an apostolate of charity, which will affect a visible union of all humankind, end quote. The Eucharist calls the church to unity among her members, but also calls the church to work for the unity of a humanity suffering the consequences of continual fragmentation. There is a continual temptation to reduce the Eucharist to a matter of individualistic piety or to an object of theological speculation or to focus principally on the liturgy to the neglect of its meaning and purpose. Merton will have none of that. Of what use is it, Merton asks caustically, to hold seminars on the doctrine of the mystical body and on sacred liturgy if one is completely unconcerned with the suffering, destitution, sickness, and untimely death of millions of potential members of Christ. Or to have lectures on Merton's Eucharist. <laughs> Pointing to Pope John XXIII's encyclical, Mater et Magistra, Merton argues that the Eucharist is directed primarily toward the creation of a just society, focused on building the kingdom of God on earth. For Merton, this means that our growth in love is characterized also by a growth in vision, whereby we are able, quote, to see Christ not only in our own deep souls, not only in the Psalms, not only in the Mass, but everywhere, shining to the Father in the features of others' faces, end quote. The Eucharist compels us to recognize in all people the overwhelming love of Christ poured out upon all, to see them as Christ himself sees them, and indeed to see Christ in them. In short, for Merton, the Eucharist is necessarily tied to contemplation. 
a point he makes frequently. The transformation that takes place, or should take place, in the Eucharist is one that is rooted in our recovery of our full, full humanity, but it is one that can only take place through the awakening of a contemplative gaze, whereby we recognize and see that we are not fully ourselves apart from God and our neighbor, and that we are necessarily bound to them. And the Eucharist is intended not simply to enact this unity, but also to provide a window, a lens for awakening this contemplative and transformative gaze. Merton provides for us a glimpse of this contemplative, of what this contemplative glaze, gaze looks like, not only in his account of the Eucharist that I've just given you, but also of his, of his account of an experience that he had in downtown Louisville. What this experience demonstrates is that Merton possessed more than an intellectual comprehension of the meaning of the Eucharist he celebrated each day. He experienced the profundity of the Mass in a manner that few of us ever will. On March 18, 1958, Merton was walking in downtown Louisville. He was probably there for a doctor's appointment. He's always in Louisville for a doctor's appointment. <laughs> Seriously. I've met a number of people who met him in doctor's waiting rooms. <laughs> He's walking in downtown Louisville when he experienced an epiphany that transformed his perception of his fellow humanity and his relationship to them. This experience, described in detail in Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, is well known. And there's a plaque commemorating this moment on the corner of 4th and Walnut in Louisville. And many people have at least a passing familiarity with Merton's description. However, few have seen in this experience the flowering of his Eucharistic theology. Standing at the corner of Fourth and Walnut, gazing at the people around him, Merton, quote, was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I was theirs, that we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers, end quote. Whereas he had previously supposed that he was separate from them by virtue of his living in isolation from the world in a monastic cloister, he was instead struck by the realization that he was in fact profoundly united with these people. This union was more than simply a shared humanity. Merton's eyes were opened to see his fellow humans as God sees them, to see them as immeasurably loved, to see them as so overwhelmingly loved by God that God, quote, gloried in becoming a member of the human race. Merton ends that sentence by then saying, a member of the human race, exclamation point. Merton writes that it was as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts, the depths of their hearts, where neither sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach, the core of their reality, the person that each one is in God's eyes, if only they could all see themselves as they really are. If only we could see each other that way all the time. There would be no more war, no more hatred, no more cruelty, no more greed. I suppose the big problem would be that we would fall down and worship each other. <laughs> and in seeing them as God sees them, Merton recognized that his own existence was inextricably bound to theirs. He writes, they are not they, but my own self. There are no strangers! Exclamation point. Merton had been writing about the purpose and meaning of the Eucharist for years prior to this experience, but there's a sense in which we can say that Merton understood more profoundly and clearly than ever before the implications of the Mass he celebrated each day. That which he knew theologically he experienced deeply on a street corner in downtown Louisville, where Merton realized that his attempts to find his identity and purpose apart from his fellow humans was based on an illusion that catered to his false self. Using words that harken back to his writings on the implications of the Eucharist as the sacrament of love, Merton recounts that on that street corner he fell in love with his fellow humans that he suddenly saw them as the God of love sees them, 
and that he could no longer live as if his life was somehow separate from theirs. It's no accident that we see Merton near this date turn his gaze more consciously to the world, focusing on the injustices of a humanity seemingly bent on tearing itself to shreds. The cloister separated him from the world physically, but Merton realizes that it could not compromise his essential unity with his fellow humans. He could not but see Christ in them. And it was this that leads Merton not only to write on issues of justice, but also to engage in a, wide, in a dialogue with a wide variety of people and to write about dialogue as being at the heart of the Christian life. This emphasis on dialogue emerges in part from his experience and understanding of his unity of his fellow humans. But a letter to a school teacher in England in 1959 illustrates that Merton understood, understands this experience of unity and the importance of dialogue to be rooted in the Eucharist. For you see, he writes, when I enter into dialogue with you and each of us knows who is speaking, it turns out that we are both Christ. This being seen in a very simple and natural light, it is the beginning and almost the fullness of everything. Everything is in it somewhere, but it makes most sense in the light of Mass and the Eucharist. Merton clearly understands dialogue to be rooted in the logic of the Eucharist, a logic rooted in our shared identity in Christ and the necessity of finding our true selves in radical openness to God and others. In Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, Merton argues that to refuse dialogue with others, including dialogue with our adversaries, is to fall prey to the narrative of a world that fragments rather than unites. A, quote, rigid, defensive, and negative attitude which refuses all dialogue, end quote, with adversaries and with those with differing beliefs is not open to those of us called to unite and to see others as Christ himself sees them. Our starting point must be respect for persons in their beauty and worth who merit being given a hearing even when their positions are opposed to our own. To do otherwise is to be guilty of what Merton calls the heresy of individualism, which is nothing else but the very sin of which Adam was guilty and which res results only in fragmentation. He writes, the heresy of individualism, thinking oneself a completely self-sufficient unit and asserting this imaginary unity against all others, the affirmation of the self is simply not the other. But when you seek to affirm your unity by denying that you have anything to do with anyone else, by negating anyone else, everyone else in the universe, until you come down to you, what is there left to affirm? Even if there were something left to affirm, you would have no breath left with which to affirm it. Those guilty of this heresy refuse to find their identity in the other, refuse to go out to the other, but instead seek to find their identity in themselves over and, o over and against the other. The true way is just the opposite, <coughs> Merton writes. The more I am able to affirm others, to say yes to them in myself by discovering them in myself and myself in them, the more real I am. I am fully real if my own heart says yes to everyone. To dialogue is to reject the insularity that characterizes a world fragmented by original sin. It means to find one's self in the other, to affirm what one really can in the other. Merton spells out the implications as follows. I will be a better Catholic, not if I can refute every shade of Protestantism, but if I can affirm the truth in it and still go further. So too with the Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists, etc. This does not mean, everyone skips this next sentence, by the way, that doesn't like Merton. This does not mean syncretism, indifferentism, the vapid and careless friendliness that accepts everything by thinking of nothing. <laughs> there is much that one cannot affirm and accept, but first one must say yes where one really can. If I affirm myself as a Catholic merely by denying all that is Muslim, Jewish, Protestant, 
Hindu, Buddhist, etc. In the end, I will find that there is not much left for me to affirm as a Catholic, and certainly no breath of the Spirit with which to affirm it. Merton argues that the Christian approach to the other is to approach them from the standpoint of openness and acceptance, to begin from a standpoint of affirmation rather than immediate condemnation. He was forthright in recognizing that there are limitations to this. There is, he admitted, much that we can't affirm or accept. But the point is that we must begin by saying yes where we can, and so approach the other as a sister, as a brother, as an equal. For the moment we do that, the adversary ceases to be an adversary. For we approach him or her on the solidly Christian ground of love that affirms and re respects him as a person who is divinely loved and who merits a hearing. If we fear to meet him on what is really our own ground, Merton pointedly asks, is this not perhaps because we are ourselves not sufficiently Christian? In 2007, Pope Benedict XVI published his post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Sacramentum Caritatis, on the Eucharist as the summit and source of the Church's life and mission. In this beautiful text, the Pope draws attention to the transformation the Eucharist is to enact in our relations with others, both within and outside the Church. The union with Christ, he writes, brought about by the Eucharist, also brings a newness to our social relations. This sacramentum, sacramental mysticism is social in character. Indeed, union with Christ is also union with all those to whom he gives himself. I cannot possess Christ just for myself. I can belong to him only in union with all those who have become or who will become his own. The relationship between the Eucharistic mystery and social commitment must be made explicit. The Eucharist is the sacrament of communion between brothers and sisters who allow themselves to be reconciled in Christ, who made of Jews and pagans one people, tearing down the wall of hostility which divided them. Only this constant impulse towards reconciliation enables us to partake worthily of the body and blood of Christ. In the memorial of His sacrifice, the Lord strengthens our fraternal communion and in a particular way urges those in conflict to hasten their reconciliation by opening themselves to dialogue and a commitment to justice. In these lines, Pope Benedict XVI gets at the heart of the Eucharistic theology about which Merton wrote and out of which Merton lived. In the midst of a fragmented world, the Eucharist is the great sacrament of reconciliation, of unity, of love. It binds us together in love and provides a window through which we can cast a contemplative gaze on a God of love and on a humanity that is divinely loved. And for Merton, and as we can see for Pope Benedict XVI, this meant going out of ourselves toward the other in dialogue. Far from compromising him as a Roman Catholic, Merton's clarion call to dialogue was rooted in his Catholicism, and specifically in his understanding of the unifying nature of the Eucharist, the sacrament of love. He did not understand dialogue to mean capitulating to the world, but understood it to be opposed to the logic of a world bent on perpetual enmity and fragmentation. To dialogue is to engage in the decidedly countercultural and yet deeply and powerfully human activity of approaching the other from the standpoint of love. Indeed, it is to see Christ in the other. To dialogue is to seek to transcend the limitations of selfish individualism that characterizes a fallen and fragmented world. It is, in short, to live out the implications of the Eucharist. <clears throat> the sacrament whose divinely instituted purpose was, according to Merton, to open us more fully to others, and so to become more fully ourselves by opening our contemplative gaze to see Christ in all persons. As Merton writes, it's my belief that we should not be too sure of having found Christ in ourselves until we have found Him also in the part of humanity that is most remote from our own. Christ is found not in loud and pompous declarations, but in humble and fraternal dialogue.
No wonder Pope Francis lifted him up as an example to us all. Thank you. We have time for questions or comments. Yeah. I could say a lot, but I'll just say thank you. That was a really exciting lecture. Um, just a simple question. Why, why do you think that some Catholics in particular are afraid to die alone with Merton? With Merton? Yeah. Um, because Merton was uh, somebody who... Merton represents a brand. Uh, there there are a lot of people who will lay claim on Merton and who have laid claim on Merton and who have endeavored to um, uh, discover in Merton somebody who was pretty good even though he was Catholic. Right? Right. And because of that, um, people have become suspicious of him and tend to take those people at their word that he wasn't really Catholic. And, uh, and, and because of that, basically, you have uh, 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 a whole group of people who view him with deep, deep suspicion, yeah, which I find fascinating. Because here's the thing, is that oftentimes these people that I encounter that are opposed to him are, are also deeply liturgically conservative. And Merton was deeply liturgically conservative, right? I didn't get to that in my lecture. I really wanted to. But, um, Merton himself, his, his, his letters uh, are filled after 1964 with lamentations about losing the Latin, right? And he said, you know, everybody here at the monastery sees me as a real old fuddy-duddy, but boy, oh boy, what are we doing, right? And in fact, I have this, I have a recording I was going to play, and I didn't get time, but of him in 1967, he, he got this tape recorder in, um, in 1966 because his hands were hurting and so he would record himself doing stuff. And he would, they're pretty funny tapes. He records himself doing all kinds of stuff. Um, <laughs> but um, at one point he decides he's going to record a full 90 minutes of him uh, chanting the Cistercian Mass in Latin. Right? That's in 1967, way past when he was supposedly not a Catholic. Uh, is pretty fascinating, and he has a nice voice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would echo the gratitude, and my my question is kind of similar for folks who might be afraid to dialogue with Merton or read Merton. Uh, obviously, there's a lot to pick from, but what would you recommend? Uh, we recommend to those folks to start reading. There are two ways to get into Merton. There, you can either get into him in his autobiographical stuff, or his. Um, essays and his, uh, his sort of writings on contemplation as well as his social writings. I think the very best way is to start with like a collection like Christine Bochin did this nice collection called Thomas Merton Essential Writings that's published by Orbis Press. That's really good. I use it as a textbook. Uh, Larry Cunningham ed edited a really nice collection of his spiritual writings that contain some really good long uh, autobiographical snippets as well as some of his poetry, some of his journals. Um, I really like that collection as well. I think the best way to get into Merton is his journals. That's how I uh, kind of got into him. He's really sort of trenchantly honest in them and I quite like that about him. And, and there's a, you can read all seven volumes if you want or you can get something that's called The Intimate Merton and it's a you know 300 page volume of edited journal entries that contain the highlights. I really like those. That's where I would suggest. I almost never tell people to start with the Cemetery Mountain now. I get my students to read it, but they hate it. And um, I read it when I was 23, and oh, I loved it. You know, it just transformed me. But every time I read, I read it, I I like it less and less. Um, he's he's what I call a Catholic bigot in that book. He's really, um, he's really, uh, he has the zeal of a convert in it, which is lovely, but also not, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so 
And so he, he's, he needed a good editor. Evelyn Waugh, this is a nice little thing, Evelyn Waugh and him became friends. And Evelyn Waugh um, published The Seven Story Mountain in, uh, in England. Um, but he, he took about 150 pages out of it. <laughs> and he said Merton needed a good editor. And he actually, he also said, he also said Merton needed a good grammar. And he, he gave, he met Merton uh, at the Abbey of Gethsemane and gave to him uh, a, a style guide on how to write. <laughs> If you know anything about Evelyn Waugh, that is absolutely in character. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you, with the Pope's um, kind of recognition of Thomas Merton now recently, yeah. do you foresee there being any more um, promoting of him, you know, declaring him as for sainthood? No. No? No. Uh, and there are two reasons why. The main reason is the monks don't want it, right? So they're uninterested, entirely uninterested in promoting a canonization cause. They, they are, it's not that they dislike Merton, it's that the monastery and Cistercian spirituality is more than Merton. And so they're not that interested. Plus many of them knew him and he could be, he wasn't always well liked by all of his monks brothers, right? He, he could be um, argumentative. He was pretty well loved, but not all of them loved him. Um, the other is, uh, I've had a long conversation with my own archbishop about this, who is the archbishop who would be the one who would promote the cause. Um, and his first question is, do the monks want it? Well, no. So, right there. But also, uh, uh, he worries, now this was before Merton got a shout out from the Holy Father himself, but he worries about, and he actually used the words brand in terms of Merton's <coughs> brand. And do we really want to canonize Merton and his brand? And we're going to have more conversations about that, I think. What does he mean by brand? The, there are a group of, well, as I said to Lenny, there are people who like Merton uh, but d like him for all the, th for not for, <laughs> they like him in, even though he was Catholic, not because he was Catholic. Yeah. They want to take, it's the Merton, it's, it's, it's Merton minus his Catholicism. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I don't think we'll get a St. Merton. And I don't think we should really. I mean, this is the wonderful thing about Merton is he's, a, he's an amazingly human person. Now that isn't to say, I was at, I was at the Abbey on Friday with my son. And I threw a little prayer to him, you know, he never, he, it can't hurt. But, um, uh, but I'm not the only one doing that. I mean, this is the interesting thing. And this is where the Archbishop kind of paused a little bit because his grave is the only one getting any kind of veneration from people. If you go there, it's, there are sobriety uh, tokens, there are rosaries, there are prayer cards, there are people requesting prayer. There is a kind of un movement of veneration which I find kind of interesting. Yeah. You, you said he was conservative liturgically. Yeah. And that he wanted to open dialogue with other religions. Did yes. Did he ever feel, or did he ever write or mention that he would be interested in drawing other religions in to receive the Eucharist? No. No. Uh, and in fact, uh, there, was a, there was an interesting peace meeting that took place in 1964 at the Abbey of Gethsemane. And it was an ecumenical peace meeting. Uh, some people that you might know of who were there were Jim Forrest. Uh, John Howard Yoder was there as well. And uh, John Howard Yoder left an, an accordion binder of um, notes that he took there, which are pretty indecipherable. But they're, they're notes anyways. And Merton records in his journal, oh, the, hor her uh, the uh, uh, name, help me with the name of the Jesuit brothers. Berrigan, thank you. Uh, the Berrigan brothers were there as well. And they had kind of a funky Eucharist out there at, at, the, at, the, at the, the Hermitage, a sort of a newfangled litur liturg liturgy that they had developed in which they um, gave the Eucharist to John Howard Yoder, a uh, Mennonite. And that didn't go over so well with Merton. Yeah. He was a little, 
Part of it was that the abbot told him that that was not supposed to happen. But part of it was, I think, there was a sense in which that kind of didn't appeal to him. Yeah. It, but that didn't preclude prayer with others. Yes. Our bishop of Fort Wayne South then has spoken about uh, the University of Notre Dame, his displeasure in uh, bestowing the luxury medal on our vice president. Mm -hmm. What would be Merton's uh, uh, take on it? Well, Merton got some awards himself when he was when he was alive, and he never went to go get them. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how much value he would place in, uh, in any award, <laughs> let alone this one. Uh, but I would say that I doubt that he would draw a line in the sand, and I think that he would write, let me say this, he had an awful lot to say against a Roman Catholicism that tended to focus primarily on issues of sexuality, uh, but still uh, lived their lives um, as if Christ hadn't touched them. Um, uh, he says that a number of times in Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. And so I think he would probably, uh, if he were to weigh in, I think he would probably say, uh, well, we need to affirm where we can. Yeah, start with affirmation rather than condemnation. Yeah. One last question, yes. Um, <clears throat> just from your perspective, um, uh, do you think Thomas Martin achieved union with God? Um, I know that people say, you know, when you get close or when you have union, often that's when you're going to die. <laughs> In a sense, uh, you're close to death. Or, uh, yeah. You know, I'm just curious because I've heard that before. And people he has this interesting experience. Talk about dialogue. He has an interesting experience in Polonarua, Sri Lanka, uh, just a month before he dies. Um, in front of, while he's looking at statues of the Buddha in Polonarua. And I wish I had that text in front of me right now. I could read it for you. But in that text, he talks about. Uh, I now know and understand what I have been looking for. In fact, I think that's a direct quote, which kind of surprises me that I remember it. Right? I now know and have realized what I have been looking for. Right? That, that there was something pretty unbelievable about that experience at Paul and Arua. Um, uh, and it seemed to be this, uh, if not an experience of unity, an experience of uh, of self-unity and an experience of an understanding of who he was in God's eyes. Um, and so I do find it interesting that it happened a month before his death. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Well, our last obligation is to thank Professor Hillis for being with us. Thank you very much.